House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski Forward. The first edition of House of Leaves was privately distributed and did not contain Chapter 21, Appendix 2, Appendix 3, or the Index. Every effort has been made to provide appropriate translations and accurately credit all sources. If we have failed in this endeavor, we apologize in advance and will gladly correct in subsequent printings all errors or omissions brought to our attention. The Editors This is not for you. Introduction I still get nightmares. In fact, I get them so often I should be used to them by now. I'm not. No one ever really gets used to nightmares. For a while there, I tried every pill imaginable, anything to curb the fear. Excedrin PMs, melatonin, L-tryptophan, Valium, Vicodin, quite a few members of the barbitual family. Pretty extensive list, frequently mixed and often matched with shots of bourbon, a few lung-rasping bong hits, and sometimes even the vaporous confidence trip of cocaine. None of it helped. I think it's pretty safe to assume there's no lab sophisticated enough yet to synthesize the kind of chemicals I need. A Nobel Prize to the one who invents that puppy. I'm so tired. Sleep's been stalking me for too long to remember. I mean, inevitable, I suppose. Sadly, though, I'm not looking forward to the prospect. I say sadly because there was a time where I actually enjoyed sleeping. In fact, I slept all the time. That was before my friend Lude woke me up at three in the morning and asked me to come over to his place. Who knows, if I hadn't heard the phone ring, would everything be different now? I think about that a lot. Actually, Lude had told me about the old man a month or so before that faithful evening. Is that right? Fate? Sure, it all wasn't full, but what, what exactly was that? I had been in the throes of looking for an apartment after a little difficulty with a landlord who woke me up one morning, convinced he was Charles de Gaulle. I was so stunned by his announcement that before I could think twice, I already told him how in my humble estimation he did not at all resemble an airport, though the thought of a 757 landing on him was not at all disagreeable. I was promptly evicted. I could have put up a fight, but the place was a nut house anyway, and I was glad to leave. As it turned out, Chucky de Gaulle burnt the place to the ground a week later, told the police a 757 had crashed into it. During the following weeks, while I was couching it from Santa Monica to Silver Lake, looking for an apartment, Lude told me about this old guy who lived in his building. He had a first-floor apartment peering out over the wide, overgrown courtyard. Supposedly, the old man had told Lude he would be dying soon. I didn't think much of it, though it wasn't exactly the kind of thing you forget, either. At the time, I just figured Lude would be putting me on. He likes to exaggerate. I eventually found a studio in Hollywood and settled back into my mind-numbing routine as an apprentice at a tattoo shop. It was the end of 96. Nights were cold, and I was getting over this woman named Clara English who had told me that she wanted to date somebody at the top of the food chain. So I demonstrated my unflagging devotion to her memory by immediately developing a heavy crush on this stripper who had thumper tattooed right beneath her G-string, barely an inch from her shaved pussy, or as she'd like to call it, the happiest place on earth. Suffice it to say, Lud and I spent the last hours of the year alone, scouting for new bars, new faces, and driving recklessly through the canyons, doing our best to talk the high midnight heavens down with a whole lot of bullshit. I mean, we never did. Talk them down, I mean. And then the old man died. From what I can gather now, he was an American. Though, as I would later find out, those who worked with him detected an accent even if they could never say for certain where it came from. He called himself Zampano. 
It was the name he put down on his apartment lease and on several other fragments I found. I never came across any sort of ID, whether a passport, license, or official document insinuating that yes, he indeed was an actual and accounted for person. Who knows where his name really came from? Maybe it's authentic. Maybe it's made up. Maybe borrowed a nom de plume or my personal favorite, a nom de guerre. As Lud told it, Zampano had lived in the building for many years. Though he mostly kept to himself, he never failed to appear every morning, every evening, to walk around the courtyard. A wild place with knee-high weeds and back then populated with over 80 stray cats. Apparently the cats liked the old man a lot, and though he offered no enticements, they would constantly rub up against his legs before darting back into the center of that dusty place. Anyway, Lude had been out very late with some woman he had met at his salon. It was just after seven when he finally stumbled back into the courtyard and despite a severe hangover immediately saw what was missing. Lude frequently came home early and always found the old guy working his way around the perimeter of all those weeds, occasionally resting on the sun-beaten bench before taking another round. A single mother who got up every morning at six also noted Zampano's absence. She went off to work and Lude went off to bed, but when dusk came, their old neighbor still had not appeared. Both Lude and the single mother went to alert Flays, the resident building manager. Flays is Hispanic, well, part Samoan. A bit of a giant, you might say, 6'4 and 245 pounds, virtually no body fat. Vandals, junkies, you name it, they get near the building and Flays will lunge at them like a pit bull raised in a crack house. And don't think he believes that size and strength are invincible. If the interlopers are carrying, he'll show them his own gun collection. He'll draw on them, too. Faster than Billy the Kid. But as soon as Lude voiced his suspicions about the old man, Pitbull and Billy the Kid went straight out of the window. Flays suddenly couldn't find his keys. He started muttering about calling the owner of the building. After 20 minutes, Lude was so fed up with this hemming and hawing, he offered to handle the whole thing himself. Flays immediately found the keys, and then with a big grin, plopped them into Lude's outstretched hand. Flays told me later he had never seen a dead body before. There was no question there would be a body, and that just didn't sit well with Flays. We knew what we'd find, he said. We knew the guy was dead. The police found Zampano just like Lude found him, lying face down on the floor. But the paramedics said that there was nothing unusual. It's just the way it goes. Eighty-some years and the inevitable kerplunk. The system goes down, lights blink out, and there you have it. Another body on the floor, surrounded by things that don't mean much to anybody except the one who can't take any of them along. Still, this was better than the prostitute the paramedics had seen earlier that day. She had been torn into pieces in a hotel room. Parts of her used to paint the walls and ceiling red. Compared to that, this almost seemed pleasant. The whole process took a while. Police coming and going, paramedics attending to the body. For one thing, making sure that the old man was really dead. Neighbors and eventually Flays poking their heads in to gawk, wonder or graze on the scene that might someday resemble their own end. When it was finally over, it was very late. Lude stood alone in the apartment, the corpse gone, the officials gone, even Flays, the neighbors and other sordid snoops, all gone. Not a soul in sight. Hey, Eighty fucking years old, alone in this piss hole, Lude had told me later. I don't want to end up like that. No wife, no kids, nobody at all, not even a fucking friend. I must have laughed because Lude suddenly turned on me. Hey, Haas, don't think young and squirting lots of cum guarantees you shit. Look at yourself, working at a tattoo shop, falling for some stripper named Thumper. He was sure right on one thing. Zampano had no family, no friends, and hardly a penny to his name. The next day, the landlord posted a notice of abandonment, and a week later, after declaring that the contents of the apartment were worth less than $300, he called some charity to haul the stuff away. That was the night that Lude made his awful discovery, right before the boys from Goodwill, or wherever they came from, swept in with their gloves and hand trucks. When the phone rang, I was fast asleep. Anybody else I would have hung up on, but 
Lude's a good enough friend that I actually dragged my ass out of bed at three in the morning and headed over to Franklin. He was waiting outside the gate with a wicked gleam in his eye. I should have turned around right then. I should have at least known something was up, at the very least sensed the consequence lingering in the air. In the hour, in, in Lude's stare, and all of it, fuck. God, I must have been some kind of moron to have been so oblivious to all those signs. The way Lude's keys rattled like bone chimes as he opened the main gate, the hinges suddenly shrieking as if they weren't entering a crowded building but some ancient moss-eaten crypt. Or the way we padded down the dank hallway buried in shadows, lamps above hung with spangles of light that I swear now must have been the work of gray primitive spiders. Or most important of all, the way Lude whispered when he told me things. Things I couldn't give a damn about back then, but now... Now, um, my nights would be a great deal shorter if I didn't have to remember him. Do you ever see yourself doing something in the past and no matter how many times you remember it, you still want to scream stop, somehow redirect the action and reorder the present? I feel that way now. Watching myself tug stupidly along by inertia, my own inquisitiveness or whatever else. It must have been something else. Though what exactly, I have no clue. But maybe nothing. Maybe nothing's all. A pretty meaningless combination of words. Nothing's all. But one I like just the same. It doesn't matter anyway. Whatever orders the path of all my yesterdays was strong enough that night to draw me past all of those sleepers kept safely at bay from the living locked behind their sturdy doors until I stood at the end of the hall facing the last door on the left. An unremarkable door, too. But still, a door to the dead. Lude, of course, had been unaware of the unsettling characteristics of our little journey to the back of the building. He had been recounting to me in many ways dwelling upon what had happened following the old man's death. Two things, Haas, Lude muttered as the gate glided open. Not that they make much a difference. And as far as I can tell, he was right. They have very little to do with what follows. I include them only because they're part of the history surrounding Zampano's death. Hopefully you'll be able to make sense of what I can represent, though still fail to understand. The first peculiar thing, Lude told me, leading the way around the short flight of stairs. Where are the cats? Apparently, in the months preceding the old man's death, the cats had begun to disappear. By the time he died, they were all gone. I saw one with its head ripped off and another with its guts strewn all over the sidewalk. Mostly, though, they just vanished. The second peculiar thing you'll see for yourself, Lude said, lowering his voice even more as we slipped past the room of what looked suspiciously like a coven of musicians, all of them listening intently into headphones passing around a spliff. Right next to the body, Lude continued. I found these gouges in the hardwood floor, a good six or seven inches long. Very weird. But since the old man showed no sign of physical trauma, the cops let it go. He stopped. We had reached the door, and now I shudder. Back then, I think I was elsewhere, more than likely daydreaming about Thumper. This will probably wig you out, but I don't care. One night, I even rented Bambi and got a heart on. That's how bad I had it for her. Thumper was something else. She really sure beat the hell out of Clara English. Perhaps at that moment I was even thinking about what the two would look like in a cat fight. One thing's for sure, though. When I heard Lude turn the bolt and open Zampano's door, I lost sight of those dreams. What hit me first was the smell. It wasn't a bad smell, just incredibly strong. It wasn't one thing, either. It was extremely layered, a patina upon progressive patina of odor, the actual source of which had long since evaporated. Back then it had overwhelmed me. So much of it cloying, bitter, rotten, even mean. These days I can no longer remember the smell, only my reaction to it. Still, if I had to give it a name, I think I would call it the scent of human history. A composite of sweat, urine, shit, blood, flesh, and semen. Well, as well as joy, sorrow, 
jealousy, rage, vengeance, fear, love, hope, and even a whole lot more. All of which sounds pretty ridiculous, especially since the abilities of my nose are not really relevant here. What's important, though, is that the smell was complex for a reason. All the windows were nailed shut and sealed with caulking. The front entrance and courtyard doors all stormproofed. Even the vents were covered with duct tape. That said, this peculiar effort to eliminate any ventilation in the tiny apartment did not culminate with bars on the windows or multiple locks on the doors. Zampano wasn't afraid of the outside world. As I've already pointed out, he walked around his courtyard and supposedly was fearless enough to brave the L.A. public transportation system for the occasional trip to the beach, an adventure even I'm afraid to make. My best guess now is that he sealed his apartment in an effort to retain the various emanations of his things and himself. Where his things were concerned, they ran the spectrum. Tattered furniture, unused candles, ancient shoes, these in particular looking sad and wounded. Ceramic bowls as well as glass jars and small wood boxes full of rivets, rubber bands, seashells, matches, peanut shells, a thousand different kinds of elaborately shaped colored buttons. One ancient beer stein held nothing more than discarded perfume bottles. As I discovered, the refrigerator wasn't empty, but there wasn't any food in it either. Sampano had crammed it full of strange, pale books. Of course, all of that's gone now. Long gone. The smell, too. I'm left with only a few scattered mental snapshots. A battered Zippo lighter with patent pending printed on the bottom. The twinning metal ridge looking a little like some tiny spiral staircase winding down into a bulbless interior of a light socket. And for some odd reason, what I remember most of all, a very old tube of chapstick with an amber-like resin. Hard and cracked. Which still isn't entirely accurate, though don't be misled into thinking I'm not trying to be accurate. There were, I admit, other things I recall about this place. They just don't seem relevant now. To my eye, it was all just junk. Time having performed no economic alchemy there, which hardly mattered as Lude hadn't called me over to root around in these particular and, to use one of those big words I would eventually learn in the ensuing months, deracinated details of Zampano's life. Sure enough, just as my friend had described, on the floor, in fact practically dead center, were four marks, all of them longer than a hand, jagged bits of wood clawed up by something neither one of us cared to imagine. But that's not what Lude wanted me to see, either. He was pointing at something else which hardly impressed me when I first glanced at its implacable shape. Truth be told, I was still having a hard time taking my eyes off the scarred floor. I even reached out to touch the protruding splinters. What did I know then? What do I know now? At least some of the horror I took away at four in the morning you now have before you. Waiting for you a little like it waited for me that night. Only without those few covering pages. As I discovered, there were reams and reams of it. Endless snarls of words, sometimes twisting into meaning and sometimes twisting into nothing at all, frequently breaking apart and always branching off into other pieces I'd come across later, on old napkins and tattered edges of an envelope, once even on the back of a postage stamp. Everything and anything but empty each fragment completely covered with the creep of years and years of ink pronouncements. Layered, crossed out, amended, handwritten, typed, legible, illegible, impenetrable, lucid, torn, stained, scotch-taped, some bits crisp and clean, others faded, burnt, or folded, and refolded so many times that the creases have obliterated whole pages of God knows what. Sense? Truth? Deceit? A legacy of prophecy or lunacy or nothing of the kind. And in the end, achieving, designating, describing, recreating. Find your own words, I have no more. I have plenty more, but 
why and to tell what. Lou didn't need to have the answer, but somehow he knew I would. Maybe that's why we're friends. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did need the answer and he just knew that he wasn't the one who could find it. Maybe that's the real reason we're friends. That's probably wrong too. One thing's for sure, even without touching it, both of us slowly began to feel its heaviness, sense something horrifying in its proportions, its silence, its stillness, and even if it did seem to have been shoved almost carelessly to the side of the room, I, I think now if somebody had said, be careful, we would have. I know a moment came when I felt certain its resolute blackness was capable of anything. Maybe even of slashing out and tearing up the floor, murdering Zimpano, murdering us, maybe even murdering you. And the moment passed. Wonder and the way the unmanageable is sometimes suggested by the inanimate suddenly faded. The thing became only a thing. So I took it home. Back then, well, it's way back then by now, you could have found me drowning shots of whiskey at La Pobelle, annihilating my inner ear at Bar Deluxe or dining at Jones with some busty redhead I met at House of Blues, our conversation traversing wildly from clubs we knew well to clubs that we would like to know better. I sure as fuck wasn't bothered by old man Z's words. All those signs I just now finished telling you about quickly vanished in the light of subsequent days, or had never been there to begin with, existing only in retrospect. At first, only curiosity drove me from one phrase to the next. Often, a few days would pass before I'd pick up another mauled scrap. Maybe even a week. But still, I returned. But still, I returned. For... Ten minutes, maybe twenty minutes, grazing over the scenes, the names, small connections starting to form, minor patterns evolving in those spare slivers of time. I never read for more than an hour. Of course, curiosity killed the cat, and even if satisfaction supposedly brought it back, there's still that little problem with the man on the radio telling me more and more about some useless information. I didn't care. I just turned the radio off. And then one evening I look over at my clock and discovered seven hours had passed. Lou had called, but I hadn't noticed the phone ring. I was more than a little surprised when I found his message on my answering machine. That wasn't the last time I lost sense of time either. In fact, it began to happen more often. Dozens of hours just blinking by, lost in the twist of so many dangerous sentences. Slowly but surely, I grew more and more disoriented, increasingly more detached from the world, something sad and awful straining around the edges of my mouth, surfacing in my eyes. I stopped going out at night. I stopped going out. Nothing could distract me. I felt like I was losing control. Something terrible was going to happen. Eventually, something terrible did happen. No one could reach me. Not Thumper, not Lewd. I nailed my window shut, threw out the closet and bathroom doors, stormproofed everything, and locks. Oh, yeah. I, I bought plenty of locks. Chains, too. And a dozen measuring tapes, nailing all those straight into the floor and the walls. They look suspiciously like lost metal roods, or, from the different angle, the fragile ribs of an alien ship. However, unlike Zampano, this wasn't about the smell, this, this was about the space. I wanted a closed, inviolate, and most of all, immutable space. At least the measuring tapes should have helped. They didn't. Nothing did. I just fixed myself some tea on the hot plate here. My stomach's gone. I can barely keep even this honey milked up stuff down, but I need the warmth. I'm in a hotel now. My studio's history. Uh, a lot these days is history.
I haven't even washed all the blood off yet. Not all of it's mine, either. Still caked around my fingers. Signs of it on my shirt. What's happened here? I keep asking myself, like, what have I done? What would have you done? I went straight for the guns and I loaded them and I tried to decide what to do with them. The obvious thing was shoot something. I mean, after all, that's what guns are designed to do, shoot something. But who? What? I didn't have a clue. There were people and cars outside of my hotel window. Midnight people I didn't know. Midnight cars I've never seen before. I could have shot them. I could have shot them all. I threw up in my closet instead. Of course, I have only my immeasurable stupidity to blame for winding up here. The old man left plenty of clues and warnings. I was a fool to disregard them. Or was it the reverse? Did I secretly enjoy them? At least I should have had some fucking inkling what I was getting into when I read this note written just one day before he died. January 5th, 1997. Whoever finds and publishes this work shall be entitled to all proceeds. I ask only that my name take its rightful place. Perhaps you will even prosper. If, however, you discover the readers are less than sympathetic and choose to dismiss the enterprise out of hand, then may I suggest you drink plenty of wine and dance in the streets of your wedding night. For whether you know it or not, now you truly are prosperous. They say truth stands the test of time. I can think of no greater comfort in knowing that this document failed such a test. Which back then meant absolutely nothing to me. I sure as hell didn't pause to think that some lousy words were going to land me in a shitty hotel room saturated with the stink of my own vomit. After all, as I fast discovered, Zampano's entire project is about a film which doesn't even exist. You can look, I, I have, but no matter how long you search, you will never find the Navidson record in theaters or video stores. Furthermore, most of what's said by famous people has been made up. I tried contacting all of them. Those that took the time to respond told me that they had never heard of Will Navidson or let alone Zampano. As for the books cited in the footnotes, a good portion of them were fictitious. For instance, Gavin Young's Shots in the Dark doesn't exist. Nor does the works of Hubert Howe Bancroft, Volume 28. On the other hand, virtually any dimwit can go to a library and find W. M. Lindsay or H. J. Thompson's Ancient Lore in Medieval Latin Glossaries, there really was a rebellion on the 1973 Skylab mission, but La Belle Nicoy et La Beauchen is made up, as is, I assume, the bloody story of Casada and Molino. Add to this my own mistakes, and there's no doubt I'm responsible for plenty, as well as those errors Zampano made which I failed to notice or correct, and you'll see why there's suddenly a whole lot here not to take too seriously. In retrospect, I also realize that there are probably numerous people who would have been better qualified to handle this work. Scholars with PhDs from Ivy League schools and minds greater than any Alexandrian library or world net. Problem is, those people were still in their universities, still on their net and nowhere near Whitley when the old man without friends or family finally died. Zampano, I've come to recognize now, was a very funny man but his humor was that wry, desiccated kind of soldier's whisper. All their jokes subsurface, their laughter amounting to little more than a tick in the corner of their mouth, told as they wait together in their outpost, slowly realizing that help's not going to reach them in time and come nightfall. No matter what they've done or what they try to say, slaughter will overrun them all. Carry on, Dawn, for vultures. See... The irony is it makes no difference that the documentary at the heart of this book is fiction. Zampano knew from the get-go that what's real or isn't real doesn't matter here. The consequences are the same. 
I can suddenly imagine the cracked voice I never heard, lips barely creasing into a smile, eyes pinned on darkness. Irony? Irony can never be more than our own personal Mazano line. The drawing of it, for the most part, is purely arbitrary. It's not surprising, then, that when it came to undermining his own work, the old man was superbly capable. False quotes or invented sources, however, all pale in comparison to his biggest joke. Zampano writes constantly about seeing. What we see, how we see, and what in turn we can't see. Over and over again, in the one form or another, he returns to the subject of light, space, shape, line, color, focus, tone, contrast, movement, rhythm, perspective, and composition. None of which is surprising, considering Zampano's piece centers on a documentary film called The Navidson Record, made by a Pulitzer Prize-winning photojournalist who must somehow capture the most difficult subject of all, the sight of darkness itself. Odd, to say the least. At first I figured Zampano was just a bleak old dude, the kind who makes Itchy and Scratchy look like Calvin and Hobbes. His apartment, however, didn't come close to anything envisioned by Joel Peter Whitkin or what's routinely revealed on the news. Sure, his place was eclectic, but hardly grotesque, or even that far out of the ordinary. Until, of course, you took a more careful look and realized, hey, why are all these candles unused? Why no clocks? Not on the walls, not even on the corner of a dresser. And what's with these strange pale books, or for the fact that there's hardly a goddamn bulb in the whole apartment? Not even one in the refrigerator. Well, that, of course, was Zampano's greatest ironic gesture. Love of love written by the brokenhearted. Love of life written by the dead. All this language of light, film, and photography, and he hadn't seen a thing since the mid-fifties. He was blind as a bat. Almost half the books he owned were in Braille. Lude and Flays both confirmed that over the years, the old guy had had numerous readers visiting him during the day. Some of these came from community centers, the Braille Institute, or were just volunteers from USC, UCLA, or Santa Monica College. No one I ever spoke with, however, claimed to know him well, though more than a few were willing to offer me their opinions. One student believed he was certifiably mad. Another actress, who had spent the summer reading to him, thought Zampano was a romantic. She had come over one morning and found him in a terrible way. At first I assumed he was drunk, but the old guy never drank, not even a sip of wine. Didn't smoke, either. He really lived a very austere life. Anyway, he wasn't drunk, just really depressed. He started crying and asking me to leave. I, I fixed some tea and my tears don't frighten me. Later he told me it was heart trouble. Just old heartache matters, he said. Whoever she was, she must have been really special. He never told me her name. As I eventually found out, Zampano had seven names he would occasionally mention. Beatrice, Gabrielle, Anne-Marie, Dominique, Elaine, Isabel, and Claudine. He apparently only brought them up when he was disconsolate, for whatever reason dragged back into some dark, tangled time. At least there's something more realistic about seven lovers than one mythological Helen. Even in his 80s, Zampano sought out the company of the opposite sex. Coincidence had had no hand in arranging for all of his readers to be female. As he openly admitted, there is no greater comfort in my life than those soothing tones cradled in a woman's words. Except maybe his own words. Zampano was, in essence, to use another big word, a graphomaniac. He scribbled until he died, and while he came close a few times, he never finished anything, especially the work he would unabashedly describe as either his masterpiece or his precious darling. Even the day before he failed to appear in that dusty courtyard, he was dictating long, discursive passages, amending previously written pages and restructuring an entire chapter. His mind never ceased branching out into new territories. The woman who saw him for the last time remarked that, 
Whatever it was that he could never quite address in himself prevented him from ever settling. Death finally saw to that. With a little luck, you'll dismiss this labor, react as Zampano had hoped. Call it needlessly complicated and pointlessly obtuse. Prolix, your word, ridiculously conceived. And you'll believe all you've said. And then you'll put it aside. Even though here, just, just that one word, aside, makes me shudder for what is ever really just put aside. You'll carry on, eat, drink, be merry, and most of all, you'll sleep well. But then there's a good chance you won't. This much I'm certain of. It doesn't happen immediately. You'll finish, and that will be that. Until a moment will come, maybe in a month, maybe a year, maybe even several years. You'll be sick, or feeling troubled, or deeply in love, or quietly uncertain, or even content for the first time in your life won't matter. Out of the blue, beyond any cause you can trace, you'll suddenly realize things are not how you perceive them to be at all. For some reason, you will no longer be the person you believed you once were. You'll detect slow and subtle shifts going on all around you. More importantly, shifts in you. Worse, you'll realize it's always been shifting. Like a shimmer of sorts. A vast shimmer, only dark, like a room. Though you won't understand why or how, you'll have forgotten. You'll have forgotten what granted you this awareness in the first place. Old shelters, television, magazines, movies, they won't protect you anymore. You might try scribbling in a journal or on a napkin, maybe even in the margins of this book. That's when you'll discover that you no longer trust the very walls that you always took for granted. Even the hallways you've walked a hundred times will feel longer, much longer. The shadows, or any shadow at all, will suddenly seem deeper. Much, much deeper. You might try then, as I did, to find a sky so full of stars that it will blind you again. Only no sky can blind you now. Even with all that iridescent magic up there, your eye will no longer linger on the light. You will no longer trace constellations. You'll care only about the darkness. And you'll watch it for hours. For days. Maybe even for years. Trying in vain to believe that you're some kind of indispensable, universe-appointed sentinel as if, just by looking, you could actually keep it all at bay. It'll get so bad that you'll be afraid to look away. You'll be afraid to sleep. And no matter where you are, in a crowded restaurant or on some desolate street, or even in the comforts of your own home, you'll watch yourself dismantle the very assurance you ever lived by. You'll stand aside as the great complexity intrudes, tearing apart, piece by piece, all of your carefully conceived denials, whether deliberate or unconscious. And then, for better or for worse, you'll turn, unable to resist, though try to resist you still will, fighting with everything you've got not to face the thing you most dread. What is now, what will be, what has always come before, the creature you truly are, the creature we all are, buried in the nameless black of a name. And the nightmares will begin. Johnny Truant, October 31st, 1998, Hollywood, California.